courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Happy New Year and welcome back to 2018. It's Dan and Matt and we're here for our fifth season of the podcast. Matt, how you doing? Good. It's nice to be in our fifth year and thanks to all our listeners for listening to us for the last five years and Happy New Year to everybody. Now let's talk Flames Hockey. You're not frozen? You made it through the deep freeze? Oh, definitely. Nice furnace works well. <laughs> That's important, isn't it? Yeah, it was not pleasant. No, it's been a crazy week. Well, if we look back at the games that were played since we uh, got together last, it's been since just for the Christmas break, but the last game that we haven't, t- or the first game we haven't talked about, I guess, the oldest one, was on December 20th. The Calgary Flames won 2-1 to one to the St. Louis Blues. Dougie Hamilton scored the game-winning goal in the third to help the Flames win 2-1 to one against the Blues on home ice. We won't talk a lot about that. That was a while ago. The game after that was the 22nd, 3-2 to two uh, lost to Montreal, and the Flames. Uh, it was an okay game. Not, uh, again, not really. The, the Flames played terribly until the last handful of minutes of the game. And I thought it was an okay game in the fact that the Flames weren't offensive, but I thought they they put on a better defensive game than I was expecting them to against Montreal. Yeah, they need to really not play like that. <laughs> Like it's, the, you can't, we, we always see the team struggle that last game before Christmas and the game after Christmas. True enough. It was kind of expected there based on, I guess, what I was expecting with the holidays coming up. Then the Flames took their Christmas break. They got some time off, which was nice for them, and they came back on the road on the 29th of December against the San Jose Sharks in San Jose. So they they went on a two-game road trip through California. Weird they didn't play the Kings on this trip. But uh, in this game, the Flames lost 3-2 to two in a shootout victory for the Sharks. Matt, what were your thoughts on this game? Uh, it... Honestly, the Flames needed to come out in the three games after Christmas and play well. And frankly, they didn't in any of them. And they got out to the lead in the Sharks game, and they gave it away. And they just stopped playing in the third period. San Jose managed to find the tying goal. It was a bad bounce, but still. And they just couldn't solve the goaltender and they had a couple of chances where they could have buried it they failed to execute they lost and they gave away points to a team they're chasing in the standings and that's something that they absolutely can't continue to do otherwise they won't be in the playoffs I thought this wasn't the best Flames game that we've seen by any stretch, but I thought that for what it was, especially that game, as we mentioned earlier, coming off of Christmas, where they're often not playing well, I thought it was a a decent effort from the team. They definitely needed more, but it was more effort than I guess I was expecting that we might have got from them. Oh, true. It's better than in past years. Like, we've seen in the games after Christmas, like, the Flames getting shut out or playing so terribly that even if they get a goal it's like a 4-1 score or something like that like it and to be fair the sharks i don't think played a great game here either no but the flames need to get that resiliency and overall team play to actually follow through and win games that they need to win and they failed to do so in this game and you and i talked about this in the last show that would we play David Riddick in this game, which the Flames did, giving Smith another day of rest? So this gave Riddick his first NHL loss as a starter. I thought that Riddick looked fine in this game. I mean, he didn't stand on his head. I think he he looked good for where he is in his NHL career. But, you know, again, the, the whole team, I think on both sides, neither team really came to play. And Calgary, I think, did an okay job of matching the Sharks for tempo in the first two. And they needed to to keep it together in the third is how I looked at this one. They kind of fell apart and got sloppy there. Yeah, and Riddick, he, in each of the games that he's appeared in, has done enough to give the team in front of him a chance to win. And that's all you need from your backup is just a chance to win. The players in front of him, they did not follow through. 
And you can't put that on the goaltender. It is what it is. And he did everything that he could. So I have no problem with what Riddick's done. And obviously the management feels the same because of the trade that happened. Yeah, we'll talk about that a bit later. Let's finish up the uh, the Flames week that was. The next night, the Calgary Flames went to one of the arenas that we've always hated, which was the Honda Center in Anaheim, to take on the Ducks. And we started the curse all over again, losing 2-1 to one to the Mighty Ducks, or I guess not the Mighty Ducks, the Anaheim Ducks. Well, when, the, when we play them, they're the Mighty Ducks. They to do everybody look pretty else, mighty. To everybody else, they're just the Ducks, but against us, they're Mighty Ricard Raquel tallied the go-ahead and added an assist while Cam Fowler scored to lead the Ducks to a 2-1 home victory. This game was a little bit different for the Flames. We know, and we'll talk about a bit later, that Michael Froelich left mid-game, early in the game uh, against San Jose with a dental injury. He broke his jaw. This game, the Flames were without him, so there was some line juggling, and I think that was part of the reason the Flames didn't do as well in the first here. Um, why don't we go with you first? What are your overall thoughts on this game? They should have won. Uh, Anaheim was not very good in this game. And the Flames had plenty of opportunities, especially after weathering the storm in the first period. They found the equalizer in the second. They should have been able to carry that on. But in the first period, they were an absolute tire fire, that, and it was a miracle that it wasn't just more than one nothing. frankly. Uh, Mike Smith, it could have if he wasn't standing on his head, it could have been 3 or 4 nothing, and the game would have been over right there. The Ducks were really controlling the pace in the first, and really, you know, they were breaking down everything Calgary tried to do defensively. There was a lot more offensive zone, let's say, attacking time than there really should have been. Yeah, and then in the second, the Flames fought back, got equalized the game, everything's fine. And yeah, then in the third period, they didn't have a shot for the first 16 minutes. It's like, uh, what are you guys doing? It, it's one of those things. It's so frustrating to see this team. They have the talent. Like, they should have won that game. Because if they would have just carried on with playing just okay against the Ducks in the third period, they likely would have gotten the two points. But they just stopped playing, and, like, they were just running around their own zone for, like, the first 16 minutes. They had no zone time, pretty much, for the that whole duration. One of those situations where the goaltenders both are doing a great job. Even the defense is doing a good job in terms of limiting dangerous shots against. But the forward group has been so bad at doing everything basically on the ice lately that nobody is able to do anything to transition the puck up into the offensive zone. And I don't understand why this forward group is getting in their own way to the extent that they are like in the, the ducks game. The only line that was effective was the Sam Bennett, Jankowski and Hathaway line. And same with the sharks game. It, all the other lines just seemed like a jumbled mess, it, even though there's chemistry between the players. It just, it's not, none of it seems to be clicking and like it, you're, like, if you have a good shift from the third line, it's not rolling over where you're getting consecutive good shifts and getting some sustained pressure where good things can actually happen. It's like, okay, we had a great shift, and then everything falls apart. And it happened in the San Jose game, and it happened in the Ducks game, and it happened in the Chicago game. And it's just frustrating to see a team that, like, we're almost halfway through the season and they still haven't figured out how to play fundamental hockey with the coaching system that is in place. You know, this game reminded me a lot of what we saw in the playoffs last year where 
Calgary tried to play their game, and I think the Ducks came out, controlled the pace in the first. Calgary came out, really brought it back, controlled the pace in the second. The veterans looked a lot better in the second. But then the Ducks were able to take the Flames off of their game, and we talked about this back in you know, the playoffs when we were watching them last year, that the Ducks were able to dictate how the Flames played and got the better of us because we weren't playing our game. We were playing their game. Yeah, it, it's one of those situations where you need to be able to make adjustments on the fly. And if, like with what happened, the Flames played poorly in the first period. They made adjustments in the second, played a lot better. But the Ducks also made adjustments heading into the third, and the Flames couldn't adapt at all and just it kept running around in circles for the first 16 minutes before they were able to actually adapt and then get a couple of scoring chances late but it was too late and it's just frustrating to see because we know that these players are good there's not nothing intrinsically wrong with the talent level it's just Matt, do you think maybe part of the frustration comes from the fact that all three of the teams that we've played since Christmas in Chicago, San Jose, and Anaheim are right around us in the standings? Like, I feel, for me anyways, like if we would have dropped one of those games to Toronto or Montreal or someone in the East, we'd be disappointed, but maybe not as disappointed because here we just gave up points to teams that we can't be given up points to. Exactly. And especially with the Flames being a little bit behind the eight ball due to their mediocre play through the first three months of the season that in order to actually make the postseason they're going to have to step it up and nobody is other than the third line nobody's really taking a hold of being the leaders on the team and even the Gaudreau Monaghan line has receded recently and there's just nobody stepping in with any consistency. Like you get the odd goal from like Kachuk in the Chicago game or uh, Furland pouncing on the rebound in the Ducks game, but you're not getting any actual consistency. And that that's part of what is the problem is that each line is really inconsistent through most of the games other than the third line of late. And it's hard to win games when you don't know on any given shift if the players that you're expecting to play well are actually going to play well during that shift. And it's it leads to bad situations where the team gets running around in their own zone and on end on end and where little mistakes get cause turnovers which cause the other team to be able to cycle the puck some more this that the next thing and it's just it's frustrating because it's not anything that's specifically like you can say point to player x and like this guy is so bad like say uh grossman from fix. last you year s- yeah you, you just get out yeah exactly Like, there's nobody that's been absolutely horrible that you can just say, okay, get that guy off the ice. Like, even the fourth line, who have all struggled at various points, they haven't individually been extremely horrible. Like, they've been mediocre, but they've had good parts of their game as well. And it's just frustrating because... It's like death by a thousand paper cuts where just lots of little minor things are going wrong, but it's consistently lots of little minor things going wrong all the time. And it's culminating in the Flames being under 500 and not very good. And that's not really acceptable for where this team should be. Well, let's look at those stats in a second, but let's look at maybe a bit brighter note, the Chicago game. Um, You were mentioning, you know, some random goals from Matthew Kachuk. We got two of them in this game, two power play goals, and Giordano scored the game winner in overtime to lead us past the Blackhawks. I'll give you my thoughts on this one. I thought in the first the Flames came out outplaying the Blackhawks. 
I thought the Flames got a lot better scoring chances in this one, uh, especially dangerous scoring chances in the first period. And I was really surprised, honestly, that it was only one nothing after the first. This was a game, though, where you've, again, got to scratch your head. The Flames have a 3 nothing lead and then let it go late. I mean, we saw the Austerly and the Taves goal in, what, a minute, just over a minute apart, and then the Brandon Saad goal late. That sod goal was a tough one to defend against. I'm not going to give the team a, a no. hard time on that one. But the Australian Taves goal, like, you you can't be dropping two goals that quick. And then ha- when I'm looking at the score sheet going, okay, we're up by three against Chicago. This is good. And then, crap, we're going to overtime, tied at three. This, I think, goes to what you were talking about earlier, is that discipline of this team. Like, we saw them do a good job early. We saw them get up on the score sheet, and then to me, they took their foot off the gas. And we've seen that so many times this season. It's like, what do we have to do to make sure this team is playing 60 minutes of hockey? If they would have played 60 minutes in this one, we wouldn't have needed to go to the extra time. Well, that you can point to each of the four last four games. The Montreal game, if they would have showed up for the first 50 minutes, they would have won that game. They didn't, and they got down 3 nothing and made a valiant effort, but, you know, too little, too late. The Sharks game got up, stopped playing, lost. The Ducks game got badly outchanced in the first period, were losing, fought all the way back, tie it, and then stop playing and lose. The Chicago game, get up 3 nothing against one of the best teams in the league, and then stop playing, and... I was impressed up. we were able to get up 3 nothing. Yeah, so was I. And, you know, you have to credit Jeff Glass. He played very well, considering it was the second NHL game. But it's one of those situations where this team can't be giving up points to play teams that they're vying for playoff spots against. And, really, they gave up five points out of the six to teams that they're fighting against and needlessly like if they had any consistency in their games they probably come away with six points in those three games and the other team's getting nothing but instead this death by a thousand paper cuts gives the other teams five points yeah they were able to get three themselves but that doesn't help you in terms of actually you know trying to make the playoffs so yeah to me that's the most disappointing part is not just the record i think that you know again if these games were against different teams it wouldn't be so bad but it's the fact that we gave up in like the last three games were all against teams that we had to beat and we get, we just gave up too many points and that's how you get yourselves that's how you kill yourselves out of a playoff spot is giving other teams free points yeah and you look at uh, San Jose and Anaheim are two points ahead of Calgary. Now, if Calgary just wins that uh, one game against San Jose, then the Flames are up by one point on them. If they beat Anaheim instead of losing to Anaheim, our points reverse and we're at 44, they're at 42. Or if we beat Chicago in regulations, instead of being behind Chicago, although tied, we're ahead of them by a point. And instead of being in 11th, we're in either a wild card or third in the Pacific. But it's this lack of execution that could cause the Flames to actually miss the playoffs, which is ridiculous for how much talent the team actually has. And the team has to get out of their own way so that way they can actually make the playoffs. And it's and it's not like they're doing anything specifically wrong where you can point like, oh, that's a major F up. It's It's a bunch of little things. Yeah. And it's It's just just not finishing. Yeah, it's just the lack of attention to detail that's the problem. And like they're play ever since uh, a couple weeks ago, they've been engaged more physically, and they are playing better throughout the game. 
I think in each one of the games since Christmas, I've seen new things that I like, things they're doing differently that they weren't doing in the past, but then things they were doing, they're not doing anymore. So it's like we improve in one area and we let them go somewhere else. And it's like, how do we boost all these things all at once? Yeah, it's like one of those uh, like video games where you have the slider where if you max one skill, like all the others atrophy a bit. And, you know, we want to get all of those bars heading in the right direction, not, you know, oh, we're playing more disciplined hockey. Well, now the scoring is going away. Yeah, you, you know. want more physical hockey? Fine, we'll give you physical. But then we can't be as good as in our own zone. Yeah, like, it's just frustrating because you can see when they're playing that when they're, they're actually good firing on all cylinders they're a dynamite hockey team it's just getting some consistency where they're doing that all the time or even half of the time <laughs> and that it, like, even if they're doing a half the time they'd probably win most of their games it's just this very in and out game that they're playing it's just frustrating because they're they should be better than this so matt you mentioned this team's in 11th and you're right they are but if we look at the standings and i've said this for the last couple weeks we're not that far out of it which i think is still the encouraging thing the flames are currently sitting at 42 points if you look at what that means um chicago's right above us at 10th they have 42 points minnesota's at 43 points they're in ninth place anaheim's only at 44 and san jose's at 44 so i mean the difference between us and a wild card spot is two points we've got colorado nipping at our heels at 41 points so you know even though it was a bad week it's not like we've put ourselves way out there we still have we're still only one win away from tying a wild card and I guess the good news for me, and we'll talk about this at the end of the show, is we have another shot at the Ducks coming up right away. Yeah, and we're going to be playing all the teams in the Pacific fairly soon. I think we're the next game's against LA. So it's good. It's just they need to get on this page sooner than later because it, it, it will get quickly to the stretch of games where they're playing almost every other day. And when all the games matter a little too much and where you live or die by each game and that's not viable <laughs> yeah you'd like to bank some points early in the season to you know make that easier. i had a i had a weird thought about that and we've seen the flames so far and we talked about this you and i about how you know maybe this is a good thing that we've had some time off in the first part of the season that they've had a couple days between games i wonder if maybe part of the problem is these guys are overthinking things. And I mean, if you look at the schedule, we've got, you know, we don't play again until the 4th. Then they're starting to play, you know, every other day for a little bit. And then they have their bye week, the 15th and 19th. But when we get into the every other day, I wonder if we might see a bit of a better performance just because the team doesn't have as much time to practice and to watch video and to overthink things. And they're just going to go based on raw emotion. I'm kind of wondering if maybe that's going to be good for this team. Yeah, well, we saw that with Sam Bennett where in the beginning part of the season it looked like he was just getting in his own way uh thinking too much gripping the stick a little too hard and nothing was going right and when he'd get frustrated he'd take penalties and everything started going wrong then he got one bounce to go his way and then in december he was the team's leading scorer so I think what you're saying is that perhaps everybody on the team is just trying and thinking too much and they just need to go out and play hockey cuz it, it it's not like if you look at the team it's not like this is a mediocre hockey team that should be where they are you know it's not like the teams under Hartley where you know if they're on either side of the playoff wild card thing you know anywhere from 7th to 13th that's about right like this team talent wise is one of the better ones and i think if they get out of their own way and just start playing i think that will help it, it's because it, it's not like they're they're making any drastic mistakes where like they're giving up 15 breakaways every game or something ridiculous where you can point 
specifically to that one thing and go, oh, yeah, that's that- what I'm thinking. If they just play with regularity, you know, they're just playing every other day. They don't have a lot of time. You know, by the time you travel somewhere, you eat, you sleep, you play. I just think that getting them in a regular habit of playing every other day might be good for these guys because you're going to have less time to dwell on oh, what a bad game we had. We have four days to watch the video and all this, and it's just, okay, let's go do it again. You know, let's watch a little bit of video, think about it, and then go do it again. And I, I'm just wondering if that might be the key here is just a more regular schedule. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're out of it at 11th, but we're not out of things yet. And as we've mentioned, we have to start turning things around. Speaking I think- of being out of it, let's talk about the Oilers. Because, <laughs> come right. on, it's... The new year. We always have to have fun with the Oilers. And if you... So right now, the Edmonton Oilers sit at 37 points in the Western Conference. Uh, or 37 points, which is third last in the Western Conference. Sorry, the only teams below them. Vancouver, who's tied, and Arizona, 23 points. Yes, and only three teams in the East are worse as well. And if you look at last year's standings, it took 94 points to make the playoffs. And... The Oilers would have to match the pace of the second best team in the NHL for the rest of the season in order to hit that mark. So I think that you can pretty much stick a fork in the Oilers, which, you know, is always a nice thing. Well, we've mentioned in the past the HockeyReference.com, Hockey-Reference.com playoff probability guide, where they actually run a thousand simulations of the remainder of the season. Uh, I don't know what software they're using, but... What do you think the Oilers' chance of making the playoffs is according to their stats right now? Somewhere between 5 and 10%. 8.7%. There you go. Vancouver's at 46 um, and Calgary Flames are 25.8%. Yeah. So another disappointing year for the Oilers. I think at some point the question is, do they learn how to draft a defenseman? Do not get Dolan. Please. You know... I don't want to see Edmonton get yet another number one overall pick. And second, don't get Brady Kachuk. <laughs> Just because, really. <laughs> All right, here's a crazy Oilers prediction I have for this year, being that it's New Year's and, you know, people like to make predictions. I, You know that I've always thought Torelli was a smart hockey guy. I think that Torelli inherited a lot of crap here, and it's going to take him a while to turn it around. But my prediction, it's a bold prediction, Chirelli moves the Oilers' first-round pick. I think Chirelli will trade the pick for some good veteran help, probably either on his blue line or in net. And I think he'll use those, not like a guy in his 30s, but a guy in his prime in you know, late 20s, mid to late 20s. I don't know who yet, but I think you could see Chirelli move that first pick, bring in a a couple good veterans and use yeah, that to build I the think Oilers you'd, around. Yeah, I think you'd wait until after the uh, draft lottery, though, just to make for sure. sure. For sure, and it could even be a draft floor deal. Yeah, but I, 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 I agree. Be, yeah, I wouldn't I agree. be surprised. I think it'd be almost foolish for the Oilers to add more young talent. They have all the young talent they need. You're not going to draft your way into you know a good defensive core. I think. Depending on where they are, you could move that pick very easily for at least two roster-ready defensemen. Oh, yeah. I agree. So I'm I'm expecting – well, I'm not expecting. That's my bold prediction. I'm not expecting it to happen, but if I was their GM, I'd seriously consider that. Yeah, well, after this season, if it goes continues to go the way it is, like they're – they're going to have to make some drastic changes to how the teams run cuz like that's it, it, it's embarrassing. Like uh, the team I think we need ev- to trail all- some time though. We've seen him making good positive moves, but you can only do so what much. you can with the yeah. crap that he's inherited. Yeah. And with most of the media, myself excluded, I'm saying like the Oilers are going to make the playoffs and be a cup contender this year, like you know, like the the entire management group's got to be under fire a bit themselves because you know you're having cup expectations and you're looking at another top five ish pick, like that's got to hurt. So. I think one of the most interesting things at the draft or at the trade deadline is going to be what the Oilers do. 
Um, I don't know what they have to sell, but I think they have to sell. So I think one of the most interesting pieces is going to be, can they sell? And do they sell for the future? Or do you try to to trade some forward for defensemen? Not necessarily trying to stay in it this year, but just trying to you know, build for the future with some other young players. So I think that'll be interesting to see what the Oilers are going to do there. Yeah, if they the Oilers were smart, they would follow the Don Sweeney model of trading off basically anything that is decent on the team at, for futures. They have a working Zamboni. Yeah, and basically anything that's not stapled down. Uh, if they can get some prospects or draft picks in. and I think at this point they don't need... They need warm bodies. They don't need picks. Yeah, well... It's I mean, if of, you look at their AHL roster, I think they could use some good, uh, some good ready and come on, you know, prospects where they know what the commodity is. I think, that yeah, giving the Oilers more late round draft picks at this point isn't the right option. No, but it, it, if they can, like, if you look at uh, what uh, Sweeney did with get moving Lucic and uh, Hamilton uh, out for uh, a couple of first round draft picks. Yeah, on the surface, that was a bad situation, but teams also need to realize that cap space itself is a valuable commodity, and, like, Boston has uh, 48 points and is second in the Atlantic and uh, fourth overall in the Eastern Conference right now, two years out from trading two of their top players. So it's one of those situations where, yeah, intrinsically it hurts because of the fact that you're getting rid of a big piece, but you can go and replace said big piece because you're still going to have free agents available and all that kind of stuff to fill the void. So it's one of those situations where the Oilers could be fixed really easily. It's just it would you'd have to risk looking like a nutcase to do so i don't know about fixed i think you could bring in some good pieces but i don't think it's an it's an immediate fix for that team no it'd take a year or two well let's get back to the flames shall we man oh sure i just you know it's a new year you gotta have some fun you know <laughs> the the big story this week was that fro leak broke his jaw in the san jose game which caused a couple changes to the lineup um the biggest one being that the flames recalled the third piece of what was their first line in Stockton, um, Andrew Mangiapani came up to the Flames, wore number 88 for the game against Chicago, played on the fourth line with Matt Stajan and Troy Brower. Maybe not the best place to put him, but I understand why you might put him there um, to start with. Mangiapani's looked really good in the AHL this year. He played 29 games, he has 14 goals, 19 po- assists for 33 total points, doing better than a point per game. Mangiapani, he's a small guy, five foot ten. We we've known that about him for a while. That we had another small guy in the system. He, I'd say, he's a prospect with really good speed and offensive instincts. He's small. He's pretty fearless in the way that he plays. Didn't notice him a lot outside the first period in that game. But what do you think is going to happen with Mangiapani? This is a long term injury for Fro Leak. Do you think Mangiapani will stick around for the whole six to eight weeks? Do you think they're going to try and cycle guys in and out? What do you think they do there? I think uh, Mangiapane's AHL career is done. You so, think he's a full-time NHLer? Yeah, and the reason being is that he's a smart, fast player, and he looked effective in the first period, less so as the game went on, but I think that he is a smart enough player that you could use him on the penalty kill, and just he's a generally effective player, and I think that... He has enough skill there that you need to see what he has. And he played effectively. He's played effectively all season. You have to see what he has there. And each of the guys that the Flames have brought up have played themselves into full-time spots. And I think that that will continue with Eat Bread. And the player, I, I when I watch him play, that he reminds me the most of is Andrew Cogliano. Just Good a, comparison. A good, smart player. Like, Cogliano's not the most talented player. That's the reason why the Oilers got rid of him, because he didn't have the flashy skill. But he's just a very smart depth player. And I think that's what you're going to see Majapane 
develop into is like your rock defensive forward that can chip in a little bit here and there, but is just a smart player. And he doesn't shy away from the game at all. He's not the most physical player, of course, because he's undersized, but he's just always in the right place. He doesn't have the best shot. He doesn't have the best passing skill, but he just does things smartly, and I think that he will become a very effective depth player for the Flames. So, Matt, we saw after the injury, the 3M line obviously didn't have three M's anymore. It was two M's and two J's with Yermer Yager playing on that line. doesn't have the same ring to it. Um, I don't know about you. I don't see Yager as an effective sort of long-term piece there. I, I think that line looked a little bit off with Yager there. The idea that I had sort of coming into this week, I think it was a good idea to put Mangiapane on line four for his first game, get him a little bit of time. He doesn't need to play a lot, and he had two veterans to play with. But I agree with your assessment of Mangiapane's sort of defensive skills. What would you think about putting Mangiapane on the 3M line? Then you've got Matthew Kachuk, Michael Backlund, and Andrew Mangiapane. You could still have 3Ms there. Yeah, uh, I think if you put Mangiapane as the left wing on that line and flip Kachuk over to Froelich's spot on the right wing, I think that would be good for a couple of reasons. Uh, the second of which is that you're getting Kachuk used to playing on the right side. And the reason why I think that You're still trying to groom him for the first line. Exactly. And I think that that would help him come along on that front as well. So that way, because like we've seen on the power play that Gaudreau is, and Kachuk seem to have a little bit of chemistry on the power play in the Chicago game where Gaudreau set him up for a tap in on the second Kachuk goal. And I think that that might become the dangerous first line. And I think that Furlan's days may be numbered on that first line. So if you can groom Kachuk to be a right winger full time, I think that would be the most effective use of Kachuk. Because I think he is kind of getting wasted. His offensive skill is there where he can be a, a 60, 70, 80 point player. And I think that he's not he doesn't have the line mates, no offense to Backland or for leak to push him up that far. And I think that both Backland and for leak are more third line players under normal situations that, and they're getting boosted by the fact that Kachuk is dragging their numbers up a bit. So I think that long term it would be a good thing. And I think that, having Majapane on that line would help to facilitate things. Looking at the rosters the way they are today, or I guess the lines of the, with the roster that we have today, you mentioned it earlier that the Bennett Jankowski Hathaway line has really come alive. And now with Fro leak off the three M line and their effectiveness probably going down, I don't know about you, I can see them almost flipping the two middle lines where the Bennett Jankowski Hathaway line becomes the second line in effect. And whatever's left, it could Chuck Backlund and somebody else becomes that third shutdown line. Um, you know, without jumbling the lines too much, if we kind of keep the lines the way they are, that's maybe what I would do as a coach to have two really solid offensive lines and, the, and what is left of your shutdown line playing the third line role. Yeah, I can agree with that. And also rewards those another, guys for great play. Yeah, another option would be to flip Kachuk over, but move Bennett up to the second line as well, having a Bennett, Backlund, and Kachuk line, and then reuniting the AHL first line and having Mangiapane with Jankowski and Hathaway as the third line. Well, that was the next question I was going to ask you. So for those that don't know, the line that's been playing in Stockton is their first line there for a lot of the season before all the recalls was Jankowski, Hathaway, and Mangiapane playing. And we could definitely make that line now. I think that would make a great third line. But, and we've talked about this, what do we do with Sam Bennett in that case? I would not be opposed to having, and you got to figure out the right wingers, but I would not be opposed to having Kachuk, Bennett, and maybe Yager as a line. Um, but that leaves Backlund as the odd man out, and I don't know you want Backlund on your fourth line at that point. Yeah, well, you could just flip Kachuk over to the right wing, and that would solve the problem, and you just have Yager as the fourth line rover type guy who could slide up 
for a shift here or there. I know where you're coming from with switching Kachuk over. I'm almost wondering if the better option to switch to right wing would be either Backlund or Bennett. I think it, you're not going to see Backlund move to the wing at any point. Um, Bennett's doing well on the left side, so that's why I'd rather... I'd say that Kachuk's doing well on the left side, too. Yeah, not producing as offensively as Bennett, but he's doing well. And I mean, that 3M line has been asked to be the shutdown line. They yeah. haven't been asked to be the offensive powerhouse. And I think he's doing well for the role he's been given on that line. Yeah. I mean, if if we could switch them around, so let's say Kachuk is right, and you had Bennett, Backlund, Kachuk, that could be a great line as well. Yeah, and I think that with the injuries, it forces the team to make a little bit of alteration and tweaks to how things are being done to see if they can find other chemistry. Because say you have Bennett move up and that line all of a sudden takes off offensively, just for sake of argument. Well, when Frolik comes back, then you have a player that you can then is freed up that you can stick somewhere else and help to boost a different line and like say Furlan struggling on the first line you could try for a leak there you could try him on the third or fourth line you could move him here there or anywhere so it creates options for the team instead of if you do find secondary chemistry with the injuries so it doesn't hurt yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, you know, we talked about last week, the poll that we asked our fans was, is it time for the Flames to break up the 3M line? And 58% of respondents had said, shuffle the guys around and let's get some more offense going. So, you know, I think fans are all or mostly in agreement, it's time to shuffle that line. And now the Flames have no choice. They have to make some changes. But I think you're right. It's one of those things where Backlund and Kachuk with Yager is not going to work out. It's not the same 2M's with somebody else it was though that line was the sum of all three parts so i think it lets us be creative with what we're going to do now mm -hmm. and and i think you know we have no right wingers we have a glut of centers and a glut of left wingers and looking at it as much as i'm not i'm not sold that moving a chuck to the first line is still the answer i think you definitely are going to probably see a chuck tried on the right at some point um i still think that we need I still think we need Kachuk on line two in some form because just to spread out the scoring. Yeah. And then like an, it, another the, top line right winger needs to be found. Yeah. And of course, like if the Flames were to actually go out and acquire a top line right winger, then hey, problem solved. You got your top line right winger. It's just you have to give to get and. If you can find internal solutions, that's always better because it doesn't cost you anything. But at the end of the day, I think you might see a little bit of A and a little bit of B. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you know, we've I mentioned this earlier that I would have tried, if we were going to break up the 3M lines, as we talked about last week, I would try for a leak on that first line. And I think if you can get either Kachuk or Bennett... Uh, going on the right and get some familiarity there it does give you that chance to, okay let's try one of them on the top line and take Furlan down but I would be really surprised if we do transfer one of those guys to the right if Furland is still on the first line at the end of the year yeah I would even at this point say you know if we start to see the Bennett Jankowski Hathaway line not being as effective potentially try Hathaway there that's a possibility. I wouldn't too. touch that line right now because they're really effective. But if we are going to tinker with that line and maybe put Mangiapane there, um, you know, that'd be great. But if they want to break up the Jankowski Hathaway, maybe try Mangiapane on right and move Hathaway up. Yeah, that's a possibility. Like, there, there's endless possibilities, really, until uh, the Flames get a legitimate first line right winger. You're going to have plenty of different options to try and see if anybody can fit there and that's not to say that Furland hasn't done a good job like he has 15 goals so you can't complain about what he's done it's just 
you always are looking to make improvements and we've seen a, the flames really missing something on the uh power play with Versteeg. Do you think, and I, I think the Mangiapane could be that guy who could fill in well for Vestique on special teams. What do you think? Yeah, I would. he wouldn't be my first choice for the first unit, but he could fill in on the second. Yeah, I don't think he's a first unit guy yet, but I think he's he brings some of those skills that we would need, especially on the PK, to, you know, to help with maybe playing less five-on-five five minutes and more special teams minutes. That's viable. And then the other big news that happened since we broadcast last, the Calgary Flames made their first trade for the 2017-2018 season. It was a trade that didn't involve NHLers, but I would say is still significant because of what the Flames gave up. The Flames sent Eddie Lack, who, as you probably remember, started the season as the backup goaltender, got waived and sent to the AHL, has been backing up John Gillies there, and David Riddick took his spot in the NHL. He got sent to the New Jersey Devils, and has now been sent to the Devils AHL team in exchange for, uh, I don't even know how you say this guy's name, Dalton Prout Prout. uh, from New Jersey, who is a defenseman who got sent to our AHL team. A little bit about Prout for those that don't know him. He's 27 years old. He's a defenseman, 6'3". This is the last year of his contract. He has played... Um, he's played 246 NHL games split between Columbus and New Jersey, but only 20, 28 games over the past three seasons. He's some nice additional depth for the Flames, and I really think he becomes that guy that we call up when we just need somebody. Remember they called up um, Anderson, and he just sat in the press box for a game? I think that becomes Prout's role now. Yeah, and realistically, Prout is a more physical defenseman. He's not offensively skilled in any way shape or form uh a little bit of a fighter nasty edge if the flames had an injury to defense and they needed some toughness in a game instead of having Barkowski draw in I think Prout would but other than that eh, you're not likely gonna see Prout ever play for Calgary so I it's more just creating room in the crease for lack moving lack out so that way uh tyler parsons can come up and that's about it and uh, it's a well, good thing uh because of david riddick his play in the nhl he made lack expendable which that was what we were thinking at the beginning of the season and in the off season that lacks there just as a in case the other goalies aren't good that lacks there to be just the holdover and Neither of the two goalies in the farm played their way into the NHL off the start of the season, but eventually Riddick played well enough to get the recall, and Lack was dispatched to Stockton and now to Binghamton. Yeah, it's been, you know, if you're Eddie Lack, it's got to be a frustrating season for you in a lot of ways because you came in, you were an NHL player last year, you came to Calgary with probably renewed sense of excitement. Season didn't go the way you wanted to, you got sent to the AHL, traded to a new team, and it's always like, oh, wow, I'm going to a new team, especially one who I would say could probably use a backup. Um, I don't think Keith Kincaid is really what they want and still go in the AHL there. So I think this is really the proving year for Eddie Lack, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens with him next year. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see him with a National Hockey League contract next year. Yeah, I could see him going back to Europe, possibly. I see him going back to Europe. I could also see him taking an AHL deal for a year just to stay here and try to prove himself. Yeah, that's possible. Um, it, it, Brad Treliving, you mentioned the goaltending situation here, and it really was. This was a deal just to get rid of Eddie Lack, make some room, and Brad Treliving, our GM, said about the deal after it happened, this gave us an opportunity to give Eddie an opportunity elsewhere. David Riddick has played well, and John Gillies is playing well in Stockton. This will open up a spot for Tyler Parsons at the AHL level. So the GM pretty much came out and said, we're doing this just to sort of shake our goalies up a little bit. Right now, Tyler Parsons is hurt. He's expected to be out for a couple weeks uh, from Kansas City. So in the meantime, Mason McDonald has been called up to to the AHL to back up John Gillies. I don't see Mason getting many starts at all except in back-to-back scenarios. And he'll sort of hold down the fort until Parsons comes back. Matt, this has to be hard for Mason McDonald, though, who, I mean, has been 
at the ECHL level, playing more of a starting role for Candace if you look at the numbers this year, to again have Parsons jump over him and get that AHL, probably the full-time AHL call-up before him? Well, it's better for McDonald to be in the ECHL. He needs to play more in order to work out his issues with his overall uh, game. And he's doing fairly well in the ECHL. Not great, but not bad. And I think that he needs the playing time more than Parsons does. When was the last time you saw a goalie in the ECHL, though? You said he's doing fantastic. True. But usually because that league is terrible that you just need to like there you're just being the sponge to absorb all the shots that you're getting because there's so many breakaways and two and ones and such in the e because the players suck frankly so you know it um it's one of those situations where parsons needs to face better players because his talent level is more commiserate with the ahl level where he needs to face players that are basically NHL-ish caliber talent. And you're not seeing that in the E. And I think that Parsons and Gillies are both closing in on being NHL ready. And I think that allowing both of them to get some starts in the A will help move them along. McDonald just needs minutes, period. Yeah, and you're right. I think for Parsons, this gets him one step closer to being NHL ready. The ECHL and the NHL are quite a different league. I mean, the AHL and the NHL are too, but the AHL is a lot more structured hockey than the E is. And if you look at the AHL schedules, it's a lot easier to have two goaltenders playing quite a bit in that league than it is in the ECHL. There's a lot more back-to-backs. They often play Friday, Saturday back-to-backs. And sometimes they even have three days in a row. And we saw that with Lack. I mean, he got a significant number of starts there. So to me, the interesting thing is going to be, will Parsons be able to steal the starting job from Gillies? And I think this is really going to be good for both of the goalies in Stockton. I think Gillies knows that, you know, hey, the, the next – big prospect for the Flames coming up, I have to maintain my spot as the starter. And Parsons is probably being told, hey, it's your job to win as the starter here. So I think that could really help both guys be on top of their game. Yeah. And competition's always a good thing. Because like we saw in Anaheim, you had uh, Frederick Anderson and uh, John Gibson come up at the same time. And it pushed both of them to be better. Because they were both getting... a roughly the same amount of games at the start Anderson took over but um it pushed them forward and it you saw even the same thing in Montreal with Price and Halak when they came up at the same time that it helped push them both to higher levels than I think that either one of them would have had if they didn't have somebody else on their heels so it's a good thing, and you can never have enough good goalie prospects. We ha- happen to have three at the moment, maybe four if McDonald elevates his game. So we'll see. Looking and at the it- Stockton schedule for January, they have three sets of back-to-backs. They play January 5th and 6th. They play the 12th and 13th and the 19th and 20th. So if nothing else – oh, and then the 26th, 27th. Um, if nothing else, I think this could be a good shot for McDonald to prove to him to prove to himself and the coaches, hey, I can do it at the AHL level. I bet he'll get one start in each one of those back-to-back series. So even if they don't keep him around, I think this could be his way of showing the team I can do it at the AHL level, or I can't do it at the AHL level. Yeah, and goalies are always frustrating. <laughs> Usually, and where it takes them until they're 23, 24, 25 for them to figure out all the details. And like we saw uh, Steve Mason with Columbus, it took him until he was 27 until he figured things out at the NHL level. And it's one of those things that sometimes it just takes a long time for goalies to sort things out. And it's frustrating because, you know, McDonald is a good goalie prospect. It's just that he hasn't put everything together yet. And it with him, it's taking a little bit longer. But the talent's still there. It's just 
will he take those next steps? And goalies are so hard to predict. That's why you seldom see first round picks getting used on goaltenders anymore, unless they're Carey Price or uh, Vasilevsky with uh, Tampa Bay. So you know it, it's we'll see. With this move, though, I think with you know two go two of our goaltenders in the AHL level, Riddick doing well the NHL. I think what this does give us is it gives us a little bit of a glut of goaltending. And if we want to move from a position of strength, and I'm not saying we do, but if we're looking for an asset to move to get something, I think it's very easy to look at, hey, maybe we move one of the goaltenders. That's possible. You know, if, the, if the Flames decided Riddich is the backup next year, maybe you say, you know what, we're willing to move Gillies to get something that we need. And that is a, a possibility. And like if the Flames were to trade with either Ottawa or Buffalo, like they don't have a lot of good young defensemen or goaltenders. So it's possible that like say that like if you had a Brody for Hoffman deal, you could add various pieces that would or for a Vander Kane or whomever really it doesn't matter <laughs> and i mean i haven't talked to the scouting staff to know but if they say okay riddick is our guy for the next two three years and parsons the guy after that we want to make sure parsons has starting minutes in the a next year if you've got an asset in gillies you may end up deciding that you know what it's it's better to move that asset than keep that asset i mean these guys are all assets in the end and i wouldn't be surprised just looking at where the Flames have strength, it's prospect defensemen and now prospect goaltenders that you might see one of those pieces moved. Yeah, well, we saw that in the offseason with Brandon Hickey. I think the Flames were determined to, to, to take a defenseman with their first round draft pick and getting used to Valamaki, and that made Brandon Hickey expendable because of the play of Anderson and Shillington and Fox. They already had three top-notch defensemen. They were going to draft another one so it made sense to instead of uh wasting an asset using that for a trade getting mike smith in that you could see the same kind of thing where okay we have three good goalies that are all coming up at the same time maybe you move one of them to address a different need yeah, it's. I'm not saying they will or won't, but to me it's an intriguing possibility looking at that as an area of strength now for this team. Yeah, and that that's also why it's fine if the Flames do end up trading a defenseman for a forward, uh, specifically a right winger, because of the fact that they have Anderson, they have Shillington, they have Kulak even, who's played extremely well this season. That none of those guys, I don't think, are ready for a top four spot yet on a playoff team. No, but you could get away with having. In that case, I think the only defenseman you could move at this point would be Stone. If you're looking at this as a potential playoff team with a top four for the playoffs, you'd have to move Stone. Not necessarily. You think Stone's good enough to slot into the top four? You could get away. It really just depends on who you're trading really it because for me any of the top five could be movable in the right situation it just it would depend what you're talking about on what the alternative is so like i'm not really opposed to trading any of giordano hamannick hamilton brody or stone if the deal makes sense and for me, that would really depend, too, on if we look at ourselves as buyers or sellers at the deadline. Yeah, well, if, I wouldn't be selling. I'm playoff. not, yeah, it's not, you don't trade from that defense core if you're selling. Like, that. You know, like if the Flames are out of it, then there's no point. I wouldn't just, even say selling, but if the Flames look at themselves as maybe not being a playoff team for this year, trade a defenseman for a forward that you can use next year. But I think if, if I'm going deep in the playoffs, or I think I might, I'm not sure that I want to get rid of any of the top four right now. And that's possible, too. It's just that it depends on what you're giving up and what you're getting. Like, if I'm looking at 
because there's two recent examples of players that are of the top four caliber that we have that have gotten dealt. And in the one case, Adam Larson got traded to Edmonton for Taylor Hall. And the other was Seth Jones uh, from Nashville to Columbus for Ryan Johansson. Now, if the Flames are getting a player of Hall or Johansson's caliber for one of those defensemen, I think you can make do with Stone being in the top four and one of the kids coming up at, with to play with Kulak. Yeah, those deals don't come around every day, though. It depends on what the other team needs. Like, if you look at Buffalo, they their team is... They have tons of forwards and no defense. And Ottawa, it's very much the same thing. So, it depends, really, on... So the thing with the Buffalo deals, you probably get Kane and Kane's a rental, and that doesn't make sense in a rental scenario. No, and for that, you're looking at more uh, Reinhardt or uh, Ryan O'Reilly instead, not... So, it it really, it depends on what you're getting. Like, you can't say that, oh, you know, I'm going to trade Giordano for... You know, some random second liner. It depends on the specific names, but if you're getting somebody that's like of a caliber of Johansson or uh, Taylor Hall for one of the defensemen, then you make do with having one of the kids play (laughs) because the Flames do need another offense, dynamic offensive player. So it just depends on what how the deal structured and who and the what's and all that. So while we're talking about the blue line and defensemen, what do you think the chances are that we could see Dalton Prout and Matt Bartkowski swap spots? Bart gets sent to the AHL and Prout be brought up as the seventh defenseman this year. To me, Prout's a better option because he is more physical to be that seventh defenseman. Yeah, I actually agree with you there. I uh, I think that Barkowski is like an inferior version of five of the six defensemen that we have. Barkowski has looked terrible this year. True. I and agree. I mean, look at Barkowski too. He was brought in for one purpose last year, which was a body for the expansion draft. He's outlived his purpose. He was brought in for one reason. We've used him for that thing, and it's like he stayed around because, oh, you're here. Uh, we forgot to cut you a training camp. All right, just hang on. Um, you know, so I think the Prout, for a guy that's on a one-year deal, I'm not saying re-sign Prout, but I think it would almost be better to send Bart down. Maybe Bart does better in the A, and if not, he's a good depth defenseman with some NHL experience to anchor the blue line there and bring Prout up as your number seven. And I would be in a real rush to make that decision, but uh, intrinsically... We'll- I agree with you. It just it, there's no urgency to it, so I just kind of let things slide as they are and see. Yeah, I'm not saying it should or shouldn't be done, but I just if I was the coach, I'd say we now have a better option in Prout than we do in Bartkowski. I agree. And right now, I don't think it's like we need defensemen on the farm they've got tons of defense there so Prout doesn't really serve them a lot of good down there we've got enough tough guys we've got a lot of physical guys down there already more on the forward side but I don't think we need another one in defense so I was kind of surprised when we saw Prout sent down I was expecting Prout to stay and Bart to be sent down so I'll be interested to see if that happens at some point yeah Matt, the other news from the week is the Flames made a signing. Not a big NHL signing, but an entry-level signing to one of their junior prospects. The Flames gave an entry-level deal to Matthew Phillips, 19-year-old, uh, who plays for the Victoria Royals of the WHL. He's five foot seven, so even smaller than Mangiapane we talked about earlier. Plays center and right wing. He's had impressive numbers for a kid playing uh, at the WHL level. Last year, he got 90 points in 70 games. This year, he's sitting at 59 points in 39 games. Really good numbers for a league like the Dub. Yeah, and it with him, it's just a matter of seeing if he'll sink or swim at the AHL level. He'll either be like a Carter Banks type 
guy who was a great junior player and then fizzled, or uh, or if he'll rise to the occasion and eventually make the NHL. You just don't know until you get there. But he's yeah, doing I mean, it. He, he, for every marker he's hit, he's done a good job up to this point. It's just, will he continue to do good moving forward? And you can't tell until you get there. He's 19. I think he'll definitely turn pro next year. I don't think he makes the NHL team next year, but I think if nothing, if he doesn't amount to much else, he's going to be a great AHL hand for a couple of years. Yep. Can't argue there. And so he's signed to a league minimum, which I think you were saying is now 750000 So good deal. Uh, Phillip's a nice kid. We've talked to him in the last couple of years at the training camp, and I think that uh, this is a good signing for him, good signing for the Flames. You can't always look at WHL-level numbers as translating to the NHL, but I think there's something there, and it's just a matter of how much is there. Is he a career AHLer, or is he an NHLer? And that'll be, the, that'll be what time will tell us on this one. So, Matt, lots of Flames news we've talked about today. Anything we missed? Anything you want to talk about that we haven't already touched on? No, it's just hoping that the team moves forward in a positive direction in the standings and that they have a good week ahead. To me, the storyline for January is going to be lines. I think with Fro leak out, as I mentioned earlier, we're forced to shuffle the lines. And I guess the question for me is how much shuffling do we do? Do we do, like you were saying, and moving, say, Kachuk to the right wing? Um, you know, do we just keep Yager on the right wing and make it the 2M2J line? I think that the, really the lines and what the coach decides to do this month is going to be the storyline of January. And I see us talking a lot about that as we go forward. Because the talent's here, and you mentioned it earlier. We've got the talent. They're just not working the way they should be, and maybe a bunch of line shuffling is, is exactly what we need. So we asked the question last week, and we talked about earlier, should the Flames break up the 3M line? That was our last poll. Over 50% of you said, yes, we should break up the 3M line. Uh, the next highest was, no, we shouldn't break it up. If it's working, why touch it? And I think that... There's some merit to both, but obviously fans have an appetite to move that line, uh, make some changes there. And as Matt and I have talked about, and Matt especially today, I think that Kachuk has better offensive upside than that line. So it'll be interesting to see what the Flames do there now. This week's poll question, now that we've seen the trade floodgates open and an AHL deal happen, who do you think will be the first Calgary Flame traded this season? There's been a lot of trade rumors so far, so we've got a number of names that you can pick from, and this time we're also going to let you write in your own name if you want to add your own thoughts. So the options that we have are TJ Brody, Troy Brower, Michael Backlund, Matt Stajan, Sam Bennett, Michael Stone, or you can write in your own name. Matt, any thoughts on who you think might be the first flame out of here this year? Uh, well, the, you and I have said for a while it's probably for a leak, but he's hurt now. You can't trade him. I'm going to go a little off the board and say Michael Furland. You think Furley gets dealt? He, and it's not because he's doing anything bad. Actually, I think it's because he's doing so well that you... Say you were to trade a defenseman for a star right winger, you could include Furland, you know, because he, he's going to get wasted. The asset value is going to get wasted if he's not on the first line producing. So if you include him in the deal, you might be able to get something in a different position that's more valuable than what Furland would be as he moves down the lineup. Yeah, my worry, honestly, and we'll talk about this as we move more towards the offseason, but my worry with Furland is what his deal looks like next year. He's making 1.8 this year on the last year of his deal. I think we all like Furland, but I think we could easily see him end up with a uh, a Lance Boma-like contract that two, three years into it might go, this guy's not worth the money. Yeah, and that's my And like concern. you were saying, he's got some chemistry on the first line, but we don't really know what does Furland have outside of that? If you were to put Furland on a line with Backland and Kachuk or even put him on a line with, um, I would say, Kachuk, Bennett, Furland, then you might really see what you've got in Furland. Yeah, and it's one of those situations where he's playing with two star players. And, he's and two star players he has great chemistry with. 
Yeah, and like that's great, but is he carrying his weight entirely? And are you comfortable with paying him four or five million dollars a season? Like if he scores thirty goals this year, which he's on pace to do, like do you want to spend five million dollars on Furland? I don't think that's money well spent. I think anything over about two point three, you're overpaying him. Two and a half, maybe three on the outside, and that that money isn't fair to him either. If he gets like twenty five, thirty goals, so that's where it's kind of tough and. Like, is he developing into a Milan Lucic type player? In which case, then sure, that's great. But it's just, it's hard to tell with him. And, and, and I, it's and one oh, of those that you can Sorry, has this year and next year. My bad. So he's got uh, 2017 and 2018, 2019. So he's not a UFA yet. Yeah. And it's one of those situations where you don't really know what he is yet. And. Like, he matched his career high in goals already this season with 15. And you don't know, is he a 30-goal guy consistently moving forward and developing into Milan Lucic? Or is he another Lance Bomo who's just having a career year playing with great players and then just going to fizzle off and be like a 10-goal guy from here on in? Well, I mean, if we're just looking at him as a filler right winger, could you put somebody like a Curtis Lazar or a... Troy Brower on that line. And well, we saw Chase on. Well, we saw Chase on play on that line last year uh, for the first portion of the year, and Chase on did get like twenty five points. So, like, so that's it. Is it that Furland's a good player, or is it that Furland's in a great spot with some guys he has chemistry with? If we put Bra- if we put Brower there, would we see Brower get points? If we put Lazar there, would Lazar start racking up the points? Yeah, and that's the worry, and you don't want to. You, but it's nice hard to identify big... exactly what he is, and like if you're getting a star right winger, then he his plum job is out the window, and then is it more viable to get a better asset with his expanded value of being a 15 goal scorer at the halfway mark? So I think you'll see Ferlin stick around. For two reasons. One, he's got a good contract for next year. He's at 1.8. Two, we are losing a lot of forward depth this year. We lose um, Backlund, who I think they'll resign, but Stajan, Yager, Versteeg, all aren't coming back. I think if by virtue of numbers, Furland will probably just stick around this year so that they have an NHL capable forward for next year and make that decision to move him on then. Yeah. So I would be I, I know where you're coming from, but I'd be surprised with Furlan being as well liked here, especially with that first line as he is, if he gets moved this year. Yeah. Um but there's there's gonna be some interesting roster moves to be made next year. Um, you know, Bennett, Kachuk, both those contracts come up, Lazar comes up, um you know, I, I think that the Flames are going to have to make some some different decisions on forwards next year, and that's where Ferland they might say, money wise, you're the odd man out. We can't afford to pay you more than two. If we've got to re up Bennett, we got to re up Kachuk. It just he might it might be you know what you're out of here just so you can get paid what you deserve somewhere else. Yep, and that I think is more likely. So, Matt, let's look ahead at the coming week for the Flames then. We're now in January. We're almost at the halfway point of the season. The Flames play 39 games as of the time we record this. And it's an interesting week coming up. We've got two very important games for the Flames, um, both of them at home. On the 4th, they play the LA Kings to 7 p.m. start time. Saturday night, the Anaheim Ducks visit us at 8 p.m. start time. Two teams that we need to take points from. And those are both games that we really can't afford even to give up the overtime point to. So four points on the table. What do you think we're going to do? They need four points. So I'm going to go with what they need and say four points, zero in regulation for the other teams and go for their zero in regulation. So you think that they're going to win them both in OT in regulation? Oh, okay. Yeah. They get zero. We get four and go with yeah. that. You know, they if, need if, it. They need it. And that's it. <laughs> you know. These first three games of the month, it's LA, Anaheim, Minnesota on the ninth. We need points in all three of those games. We can't afford to not get at least one point in all of those. Then we play Tampa Bay, Florida, and Carolina. 
Those are the games that, you know what, you need a point, but if you're giving one up, it's okay because they're all Eastern. Then we take a break and we come back with Winnipeg, Buffalo, LA, Edmonton, Vegas. So most of this month is honestly teams that are chasing us. Yeah, like they need to, there's what, five, 11 games. They need to, it would be great if they won eight. And is it doable? I think it is. Yeah. So uh, they need to start racking up points so that way they climb in the standings, secure themselves a actual roster, playoff roster spot, not a wild card spot, and start building towards pushing for Vegas and L.A. Which, who well, would have thought that Vegas would be leading the, the Western Conference at, you know, and I think they're second in the NHL right now. According to Hockey Reference's playoff yeah. prediction thing, they have a 99% chance of making the playoffs. Even if they're not as high as they are, if they start to slip, they're at this point, they're not going to slip out of a playoff spot. Yeah, like it, it's ridiculous. Like They'd have to go into tire fire mode really quick. Only Tampa Bay is ahead of them and only by four points. So You know, I was talking to a friend of mine over the break, and he asked a good question. He said, do you think the Flames – change the expansion process like the expansion drafting process for seattle to make them less competitive do you think the flames are going or do you think the nhl is going whoa we don't want them to be that competitive or do you think they kind of have to keep it the same now well vegas was just at the right place at the right time because the teams that uh, there's just the right amount of talent level where there was just enough talent to get a bunch of good players together and it just seems to have worked out for them perfectly i don't think that they're that good on uh, paper they shouldn't be doing as well as they are no like they're 9 and one their last 10 like give me a break they're not that good but they're not bad like i, I was kind of expecting that they'd be in the 10th to 12th range at the end of the season i was wondering if vegas or edmonton would be higher in the standings yeah like I was frankly thinking that they'd be right around where Calgary is right now. And actually, if you swapped the two, that would have made more sense with what I was expecting for the season. So um, I don't think that they're a lock to make the playoffs still. I think they could regress if they stop getting horseshoes, <laughs> you know. But uh, yeah, we'll see. The big question to me too is: Can Vegas repeat this next year? I honestly think this uh, I might doubt be. It. I, doubt I think it. this might be Mark Andre Fleury's last year. Um, I, I just I don't see them repeat. I don't think that, I think it's a flash in the pan for this team, and I hope they enjoy it while they got it. Yeah, I don't see this happening again. That'd be ridiculous. Like I, I don't see that the, the collection of players that they have. You know, it, because of the fact that they're a new team and all that, like you have no playbook against them. Really, and Gerard Gallant's a good coach, but when you get a book on a team, you can start to nibble away at their deficiencies, and I think that part of what they've had the advantage on is that they had no obvious deficiencies, and I think that partly was when the Flames uh, made the playoffs in the first season with Hartley, is that they were catching teams by surprise with the late game comebacks and the drive in that season and then teams adjusted to the flame system and they fell off the face of the earth and i think that you'll see if vegas makes the playoffs i think that next year they're going to be a bottom feeder i i don't know about you i would say at this point gerard galland has to be a jack adams nominee I think you can already package that one up in a shiny box and already write engrave the name on the trophy. Even if they screw up the rest of the way, it's his. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, I don't know if he'll, I don't know if he'll win it just because the NHL likes to give it to whoever wins the Stanley Cup. But I think he's definitely got to be in that conversation. He's taken a team that shouldn't have done anything and put them in a definite playoff spot. Yeah. So, all right, well, I haven't given my prediction on this week. Two, point, two games on the table, four points. I think after what we saw in Anaheim, I'm more optimistic of what could happen again with Anaheim and our barn. 
I'm going to say that we beat Anaheim in regulation this time, and I think that we're going to give up a point to L.A. I think we'll beat them, but we'll give up a point in overtime. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with four points for the Flames, but they give up one they shouldn't be giving up. Works for me. All right, Matt. Well, we will talk to you next week as we look ahead to the Flames' road swing and then their bye week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hope you had a happy and safe New Year and a Merry Christmas. And look forward to the re- covering the rest of the Flame season and hopefully some interesting playoff games down the line. Happy New Year, everybody. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.